Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are starting our second day of the conference, Discourses of Childhood and Social Education, and I have a great pleasure and honor to introduce to you our first three keynote speakers this morning. Uh, Professor, uh, uh, I will display. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Professor Ivo Girasek uh, from uh, Thomas Bata University in Zlin in Czech Republic. Uh, Professor Agnieszka Naumiuk from University of Warsaw. And Stephen Ogeneruro Okpada, I hope I said it correctly, from Warwick University UK, but also representing Bowen University in Nigeria and a research center from a Canadian university, that name I have forgotten, I'm very sorry. <laughs> but thank you all for being here with us today and uh, thank you all for watching uh, us on YouTube uh, channel and through Click Meeting. Uh, today's program starts with these three keynotes. Then we move on to a hybrid session with the International Journal of Social Pedagogy who will be uh, transmitting uh, a joint session with us uh, from UCL in London then we have a lunch break, and then after the lunch break, we move online to listen to Professor Claire Cameron from UCL, and then a, s a session of uh, uh, presentations um, and a workshop with a professor from Argentina, Cecilia Shogun, and at 1600, the closing keynote by uh, Professor Kathleen Mannion uh, from Royal Roads University in Canada. So our conference will finish at about 1630. The first part is here and transmitted on YouTube. Second part is hybrid here and on YouTube. And the final part is online. So thank you all for coming and have a wonderful experience. I introduce to you Professor uh, Ivo Girasek uh, from Czech Republic. Please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming here. And firstly, let me thanks to Anna and the program committee for inviting me. I'm really proud and very glad to be here and now with you and share some ideas about spirituality. I came from Czech Republic, a little bit south from here, from this place, about six hours by train. And I don't sure you can know Zlin city because it's only 75,000 inhabitants, but 10,000 students at Tomáš Batia University uh, with six faculties. One of them is Faculty of Humanities, where I teach some uh, subject dealing with education. Uh, I would like to say you something about Czech Republic and religion because Czech Republic is the in the center of Europe, so we can say, okay, it's a traditional Christian country, but doesn't it? I am not sure. Also, something about spirituality, because the connection between religion and spirituality is not so easy how we can say for the first side, and something about spiritual literacy and its development. So, Czech Republic. <clears throat> Uh, Czech Re Republic, uh, I don't know if have you been there, at least for beer, as a colleague from Belgium said us yesterday, we are also very proud for our beer because first lager was produced in Pilsner in Czech Republic and is still producing. Or maybe you can see some from handmade glass or something from jewelry, etc. And quite a rich history from 6th century from Slavonian pagans to Christians and quite a lot of, of buildings in Prague city, etc., etc. But what about religion? Uh, traditionally, we are historically history land Czech, Bohemia, and Moravia land. And Christianization of this part of the Europe was uh, in through 9th century. And we can see some different movement in this country. For example, 14th century with Jan Hus and Husit's um, movement against uh, Rome and Pope, etc. And also some Czech brothers from 17th century with uh, personality of John Amos Comenius, which was quite famous in education also. 
But in 20th century, in between war time, we can see three main churches in this land which are still very active and are still the most important. Of course, Roman Catholic Church, uh, Czech Brother Evangelical Church, and Czechoslovak Hasid Church. But what about nowadays? We can see comparison between, between the census from last year and three decades before. So we can say that from 10 and a half million of population, only 13 percent declared their religion confession compared to some concrete church. 9 percent declared them as believers without any church, but even one of two people declare as atheists. And we can see declaring of, of religious people from more than 4 million inhabitants in 1991 to only 741,000 last year. And the same is in other churches. If we <laughs> imagine that third, the biggest church has 23,000 believers and 21,000 believers declares as Jedi's from Star Wars, Star Wars. So we can say, wow, it's surprising. And 2,000 Pastafarianism. So the church of the flying spaghetti monstrum. So, you know, the religion has really no so easy situation in my country. It's something special and parodic and other religions are quite active. But even worse situation is between young people. There is another search uh, among population between 16 and 99 uh, years old and 91% of these young people has no religious affiliation. Compared to Poland, only 17% and only 1% in Israel. 70% Czech young people have never attended a church service. 80% have never prayed. What does it mean? Of course, religion doesn't play the significant role in my country as it was in history. There is completely different situation compared to, for example, 19th century where Christianity was very strong in my in Czech Republic. Czech Republic is definitely atheistic country, probably the peak of godlessness. And people are, maybe surprisingly, quite spiritual. There are many, many different spiritual paths, different spiritual ways, how to improve their deeper experience. So on the, other, on the, on the one side, people are quite hypersensitive for the terms like religion, holy, sacred, etc. What does it mean for education? How we can communicate with children about this deep connection to ourselves, to our people, to the nature? I suppose we have two main questions for today. How to speak about deeper experience in, with Czech children and what discourse we can use. Should this be, for example, psychology? Because there is a huge number of literature dealing with religious experience and also peak experiences, Maslow or flow, and many, many other concepts, how to describe this deep existence. I prefer education, so I use the term transformative experience because, because these different types of experience can change our life. Change, can change our approach to nature, for example, to other people. So religion is definitely hidden discourse. But spirituality, I am sure, is very living in my country. So I prefer spiritual literacy as the possibility how to use deeper experience and, and communication with Czech children and not only with them. If we look at the literature, we can see a lot of different understanding. What does it mean, spirituality? What is type of connection with human life? The first of possibility is spirituality health. We can see two different 
understanding. For example, spirituality is part of health as wholeness understanding, or we can speak about spiritual health as as a independent phenomenon. But there is also quite big literature which criticizes such understanding, because on on one side there is many of of research how to uh, declare that spirituality can improve our physical and mental health. But on the contrary, this connection should be not sufficiently valid. Critical assessment of the pursuit relationship is needed. So we don't have clear answer. Another understanding is spirituality and personality. And we can see many different types of, of understanding of, of personality, for example, big five, and spirituality should be sixth factor in this understanding, or should be a little bit more than four factors of Jungian, Jungian functions. Another understanding is spirituality and intelligence. Spiritual intelligence as, as independent phenomenon if of our personal being. But I see some problem with this type of understanding, and probably is because I am living in Czech Republic. So there is not strict, strict distinction between religion and spirituality in both conceptual and research understanding. And I suppose this is problem for people who criticize connection between religion and health, for example. And I am sure if we uh, look at the spirituality not in a static way, but in dynamic. We can improve this part of our being, so this could be path for our new, new understanding and new way. So, firstly, spiritual literacy, in my understanding, is based on non-religious understanding of spirituality. I am sure we can think about very deep connection between people and their environment. And it's not necessary mean this connection is religious. So the spirituality, of course, should be developed in a religious context. Every religious people say yes, and many of them say probably is the only way. I suppose it's not the only way. One way, there should be also increased by non-religious phenomenon. So, I don't know if it's consensus, but many, many literature, many research said that, okay, we have four types of relationships in spiritual understanding. Relationship to myself or to oneself, relationship to other people, relationship to nature, uh, relationship to wholeness or transcendence. There should be a little problem. How to understand transcendence without God. But I suppose just Maslow or other psychologists can help us in this peak experience as transcendence of oneself to you know, different state of consciousness. So there is some working definition of spiritual literacy based on these four, four uh, aspects. But I would like to say how we can develop this spiritual literacy among children. In early childhood, education is definitely free play. Many articles are written about how to play freely with children, how to uh, show them how we can improve ourselves in this aspect of our being. At school, education should be picture book or, or story book or comics, uh, if yesterday was mentioned also comics. And I suppose philosophy for children like special aspect of thinking about deep, deep aspects of, of reality should be a good way for secondary school or for uh, old school school children. And in adolescence, I'm sure it's outdoor education. I am fan for these, these journeys to be in nature and to feel connection with nature under you know blue sky or sky star sky it's really a wonderful experience so two examples from Czech Republic uh, 
Yesterday, Rudy said that there is somebody who collects uh, comics and has 17,000 comic books. I am not sure if he or she has also rychlé šípy, fast arrows or <laughs> something like that. It's Czech comic and it's very popular in my country, but unfortunately, probably absolutely unknown abroad. Uh, Jaroslav Foglar was Czech writer, Czech scout educator, uh, author of comic screenplays, etc., etc. It's it's a story about five boys who experience some adventure in in common uh, common environment in city or in nature, and this is <clears throat> we can say one from many different writers, one from many different stories, but surprisingly. Foglar is really very popular in, popular in Czech Republic and nobody knows why, because he was a guy who doesn't have, didn't have any formal education. He has no maturity, he, has, you know, he doesn't care for intellectual work. He wants to live with boys, but four different sciences are interested in his work. Comic studies, because Rychlé Šípy is the most famous comic <laughs> comics in my country. Literature science, of course, because he wrote some novels. Pedagogy, because he was educator. But, surprisingly, for maybe five years, also religious studies are interested in this type of literature. Why? We can we can see some terms like the word of myth, symbolic universe, functional equivalent of religion, initiation. So we thought, okay, how it is possible? And we asked people and had empirical survey with more than 1,000 readers of this, of this book. Most of them were people between 35, 50, 55 uh, years old, so adult but usually read this book or these stories where they were 12 or 14 years old. So it was really memory for childhood. And even every second of these people declare that this literature has spiritual inspiration for them. Why? It's about five boys who are going camping, but it was spiritual impulse. It was about goodness. It was ethical way, how to help older people, for example. And, <coughs> and uh, maybe, of course, we don't know uh, uh, if more spiritual people more read this book or this book can improve our, our spirituality. I'm optimist and I suppose that reading this book in right way, in right age, 12, 14 years, these people really could imagine deeper understanding of their lives. They really want to help others. They really want to be in nature. And it should be a really transformative experience for, for Czech children. Second example is from Winter Outdoor for adolescent. I spent a few courses in winter nature <coughs> with hard snowshoeing and camping in tent on snow when you are freezy and you are really, you have had backpack on your back and you have to have everything you need with you. And you are physically demanding and nothing is clear and happy and it's very hard. But when we ask people what does it mean for them to be two weeks in snow only with fire and some talking with people? Surprisingly, there was exactly these four relationships which we defined as spiritual understanding. The people has time to think about themselves. They think about their life. How to live in future? What can I change in my relationships? in my family, in my hobby, in my job. Second, relationship to others. Because the people need to help each others. 
it's not a way for solitude way in aloneness. The people have to help each other. Help with tent building, with cooking dinner, with heavy backpack, etc. So the relationship to other are very common experience from such situation. <clears throat> relationship to nature. If you are standing around fire and you are singing and saw the star sky, what can be more in, in, imaginable? What, what is nature? So it's really for best, best experience from such environment. And last one, relationship to transcendence. People use some spiritual metaphors, like full being in present. So such kind of maybe Buddhistic concentration of, of uh, present time. But also such religion experience for people who are religious. So I am sure there are a huge number of ways how to develop spirituality of children, even in atheistic environment like is Czech Republic. If you have any question, I am ready to answer. If you can ask me by email, there is short one for your possibility. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. I think we take the questions at the end. Uh, and now I'd like to invite Professor Agnieszka Naumiuk from University of Warsaw. Uh, do you have a presentation? Uh, yes, on? it should be on, on the computer. Thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor and privilege to be here with uh, such a great, enthusiastic international audience. My name is Agnieszka Naumiuk, and I teach at the Warsaw University Faculty of uh, Social Pedagogy. So this is our bridge with, um, with the team of this university. And we are trying to build also collaborations in many ways. So this is also one of the ways of exchange of ideas and, um, and knowledge. Um, I was thinking, you know, that uh, my research on, um, on the topic that I will show you in a moment, uh, the, the life and, and, and work of Jane Adams, fits perfectly with the uh, topic of this conference, uh, that it is c connected with discourses about our life, our, uh, our work, and what we do, and how we reflect on it. So having such wonderful presentation before me about spirituality, I couldn't get better attention than talking about devil's baby. I'm joking, of course, but uh, it is a time also to think how we perceive our work and how we reflect on it. And I would like to show you um, the case, one of the cases that um, probably there are many, and Janusz Korczak has a lot of such stories about his children, and I was thinking that one day we could have a comparison of what Jane Adams was doing and, and Janusz Korczak, but going to the point. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit of the context uh, of Jane Adams and her work and her achievements. And uh, of course, she was, as you can see, she was not Polish. So why Polish person is interested in some, uh, some models or, or some work of, from international perspective? This is global world, and we are uh, making these exchanges. We are looking for uh, who was doing what and how. And I found it interesting, uh, the story and life and, and activities of Jane Adams, who was activist, who was uh, doing a lot of integration uh, work um, with uh, immigrants in the US, uh, immigrants from Europe. Um, so um, it will be, this context is also showing that it is not necessary uh, our time, but uh, the, university, the universality of the, the work is, uh, is also having impact on our lives today. So uh, as you can see, she was uh, a famous person. She, was, she won Nobel Prize. She is considered as American heroine, a person who has done a lot for the change in the US, 
uh, especially in the community development discussions. She was having a lot of um, interesting um, achievements, especially um, by organizing settlement in Chicago. Um, the, the context is also important for the immigration waves in uh, the, the times where she was working. She was working with um, poor people who were just emigrating to the US. They had uh, very bad conditions of living and, and work. So she was trying to help uh, people at the same time. Uh, it was progressivist uh, uh, times where uh, many people from intellectual uh, groups and universities tried also to, uh, to make uh, not only one time stop support, but have a little bit more of uh, integrative and more, a little bit more uh, of planning and uh, empowerment and development of the society integration uh, as such. So um, uh, her major achievement, as we say today, is Hull House, um, a model of settlements that uh, she and her um, colleagues and friends and other uh, people were, were doing. She was not alone with this. There were many people trying to get um, into the um, areas of poverty having the, the houses and be with people. Not only come and help, but be within this, uh, these communities. So first of all, it was the idea to start the buildings, to build or to rent buildings and have the volunteers who would uh, work there for more than uh, a month, um, perhaps even year, for years. So you can see from the slides um, what were the activities. I, I cannot go uh, further with this uh, because of, of uh, lack of time, but I would encourage you to, to see uh, the model of settlements in the US in different places, but Chicago was uh, the, the model one. For us, for social pedagogues, it is important that we also see how um, this idea grew with the co collaboration with these, uh, with these uh, immigrants. It is not you know, just uh, the education or establishing school, but the, the concept of having community engaged in developing the different uh, vari variety of, um, of activities, including cultural, including uh, school, in including sports, and vocational uh, training. So it was very complex, very holistic. And many people were who were living there for years, they were uh, they were seeing the, the, the progress day by day, year by year. So it was not just, as I said, one time moment support. That's why it, it was important also for, uh, for the country to, to get the, the idea of integration uh, with newcomers. Uh, so the story that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, my research is about Jane Adams' work, but I learned from her text, and she has written a lot of interesting stories, that there are um, many, um, many re reflections of her, and I think part of her fame is thanks to these reflections that we can read, also like Korczak. So reading, writing is, is part of our job as social educators, and she wrote a story about uh, the, uh, the specific situation at one time in her whole house, uh, where, what that happened. So you can see online the entire story. Okay, I'm not going to uh, read the story for you to now, but I encourage you to go to the story to online, and it's in English, so it's easy to um, uh, to reflect on it later. Uh, and this is the the title, uh, what she really wanted to say through this story. Um, I will do it this way, that I will give you some time to reflect and read um, in this color, um, kind of, I don't know, it's not blue, but um, it is uh, different than in my comments in, in black, uh, because the text is also showing the analysis that might be interesting for educators, for social pedagogues, for people who are talking about how how life is going on and what is what is happening. So the story starts with the situation when there is a very unfortunate uh, birth 
of a child who we could say today has pathomorphology uh, uh, problems. So it's newborn that has, uh, as you can see, um, different body. So the society, uh, the community of poor people from poor immigrants is reacting um, in a very shocking way to Jane Adams. She has established the whole house, she, she wants to help them, and she's seeing, you know, um, there are people coming and they want to see the baby and she tries to hide the baby and the mother from the, from the audience, from, from people. So she's surprised why they are reacting in, so way, in such way, why they want to see the baby all the time, why this excitement and uh, it is an uh, unfortunate situation for the baby, for the entire also work in the community. So she's uh, having challenge to understand them. She's having, um, she, she's trying to collect data on how people react on such event and what to do with it. So you can um, see that she's trying to analyze human gossip, right? That she's, her interest is starting to go into the research that people have their stories. It's not the story that it is real, but also that there is gossip around the story that people don't know the, the beginning in. So she's trying to observe, she's trying to analyze, and she sees diversity of the stories. What is going on, how children, or what is the reason why children um, have disability, for example, or uh, are with disability. So it is connected also with our talks today, uh, how people react and interpret the reasons and the consequences, of course. So social knowledge is also connected with that, right? We are studying as social pedagogues, not only we, we do some help, but also uh, react uh, and, and study social knowledge. So judgments, people judge others, and we judge them as professionals sometimes. So she's trying to use her uh, expert's knowledge uh, confronted with reality. She's trying to analyze uh, also human beings, who people who are educated, who are supposed to help, and they have also their superstitions. So how to really uh, get to know with this knowledge and how to um, build uh, some solution after that. So you have uh, different stories, different uh, visitors, and um, lots of uh, problems associated with it. But she's, start, uh, she's going further. She's going with the reflection and more understanding, and I put it in the red letters, maybe some, some words, but you can find any other. Uh, more understanding and more reflections because she's starting to build relationships with the people. She's not only saying, okay, you are bad people, don't go, don't come. She, on the contrary, she's coming, she's listening to them, she's uh, discovering histories of these people, and she discovers there are many uh, women who are, old women who are coming and talking, and in fact, the, this, this situation is bringing their own uh, memories of, uh, of difficult situations. So it's not that they are bad people. There are people who would like also to talk their stories. So surface, so something that is hidden from the surface when we only think about, you know, unfortunate situation that we need to also to, um, to talk about uh, each other and our reactions and our uh, maybe also mistakes. So the reflection in general on her, uh, of, of her work, and um, again, I would rec uh, recommend to, to read it because it might be also only my perspective, is to talk and to reflect on vulnerability and its consequences. And part of the consequences is uh, that there is a common uh, experience of motherhood in situ situation of poverty. There is immigration, there is aging, pain, there is impact of bad experiences of people who, uh, who, who have uh, or who had alcoholism and brutality uh, in their uh, families. There is fear of children. So she discovered many things through talking to these people. And uh, she's 
try to understand the precary situation. She tried to understand um, the lack of hope and interest in life. Uh, she, uh, she was thinking about defining poverty, in fact, and defining it through the conversations. So the, um, the reflections from social pedagogy that could be um, learning lessons and relevance. I think that w when we read uh, texts from the past, we also uh, reflect on the, on the present and perhaps on the future um, in many occasions. But we can talk about many things. I just said that these are selected ideas that uh, come uh, through the discussions and discourses, in fact, about childhood, about society, about uh, uh, vulnerability, about community, where uh, we can proceed the, the way. So the, the understanding is a process. It's not a one-time solution, right? Um, versus ad hoc reactions. It might be one thing of discussing and, and have discussion uh, on this aspect. We may talk about reflective listening, reflective thinking, reflecting uh, about empathy, about change that is connected with knowledge in process. We may talk about education uh, in the complex of reactions with the other. Uh, we may talk about transforming professionals, like, uh, like Adams was saying, that she was having different emotions and different uh, aspects, but she was learning humanity. And socially conscious advocacy, right? Uh, versus group representation. We fight for people's rights, but we also need to listen to other groups and, and have these discussions. And researchers, uh, activist bias. She was not from nowhere. She had her experiences. She had her uh, perspectives. And uh, the same with all of us, right? So uh, and another uh, question is about the neighborhood. And uh, who is our immigrant um, um, friend, neighbor, and a person. So I was thinking about um, horizontal vers versus vertical approaches. So the story rele relevance and university, uh, universality of Polish context. We may have also our interpretations on the how someone's work is relevant to our context and. Uh, you can see um, there are at least three of them now in Poland, or could be now in Poland. One is that we also have immigration wave now, now. Uh, not only from Ukraine, from Belarus, from other places around the world where Europe is seen as the place where people would like to land and, and have happy life, like uh, in 19th century, the US. The dilemmas and, and, and lot of the conflicts um, in the situation where children and families suffer. Uh, the roles of institutions uh, and professional uh, activities. But my, uh, my question would be who is our neighbor? And it also calls the spirit spirituality where uh, Martin Luther King wrote uh, his famous speech, who is our neighbor? Uh, so um, I, I don't have. I don't think I have more time. So I'll conclude with um, maybe questions. Uh, what is this story telling us? So it can be open discuss discussion about the uh, the mother who suffers and child who suffers, and we don't see from this uh, presentation maybe uh, so much of them. But Jane Adams is talking about them as well. The society, the cruelty of the society, but superstitions in the society, maybe how we call and we discuss the abnormality or pathology or difference uh, and so on. The hidden truth, what is really happening uh, beside the scenes and beside the speech even and, and behaviors. And many other things that I have tried to, to show. So. Uh, thank you very much, and um, my question to all of us is what is the story telling you and me and how we could discuss it during the break. Thank you. Thank you very much, and now I'd like to ask Stephen Okpada uh, to present his uh, contribution to our conference. 
Welcome, Stephen. Good morning, gentlemen and ladies, and not ladies and gentlemen this time around. Uh, I am Stephen Ogeneruk-Bada from Nigeria, a country that is currently at a crossroads as a result of various uh, social, political, economic, and religious crises, such as um, climate change crisis, uh, terrorism, ethnic crisis, and a whole lot of others. I will be focusing majorly on um, uh, terrorism in Nigeria, especially in the northeastern region of Nigeria, and how it has impacted um, negatively on the child. Not only its impact, but I'm going to look at how it affects the psychological well-being of the child. Majorly, I'm going to uh, you do a context uh, analysis of a particular film titled Sambisa, which was produced in 2016, and capture the challenges the child encounters in the face of terrorism in Nigeria. I will argue that the cinema of child participation in insurgency also mirrors the child resistance to suppression by the terrorist group. Now, in 2002, the organization Jamat al Asuna Lead Dawal Jihad, popularly known as Boko Haram, was created, founded in the northeastern region of Nigeria. This organization was founded by Mohammed uh, Yusuf, uh, who later adopted the ideology that Western education uh, was forbidden. The decolonial stance of Boko Haram later degenerated into its campaign of violence, which led to uh, the killing of its founder in the Nigerian state. The post Yusuf's era actually led by uh, Abubakar Shekau, Yusuf's second in command, have been characterized with um, numerous suicide bombings, the displacement of people in North, northeastern region, kidnappings, and other terror-related uh, activities. All of the above scenarios had been in the northeastern uh, geopolitical zone of the country. There have been various permutations about the upsurge and success of this uh, terrorist group. Uh, some of these permutations include uh, illiteracy, radical uh, religious ethics in the context of Nigeria, uh, Sharia law, and also the political schema where opposition parties tend to truncate the chances of government in power. But interestingly, the place of the child uh, in the advancement of terrorism in Nigeria and how it impacts on the psychological lives of the child, of the children, seems to have been overlooked in scholarship. This is the lacuna my study aims to fill. Now let's move on to uh, look at the nature of terrorism in Nigeria with reference to how the child participates in the process. Now one of the earliest cases of uh, participation of, a of the child or perhaps a young adult in terrorism uh, in Nigeria is uh, actually uh, could be seen as, um, you know, in December 2009, uh, Abdul Mutalab Umaru Farouk, um, a Nigerian based in the UK, actually attempted to detonate a bomb hidden in his underwear aboard a, a flight from Amsterdam to Michigan, the United States of America. Although the bomb attempt was foiled, the name of a young Nigerian adult uh, had been written on the marble of global terrorism. Not long after Abdul Mutalab's uh, incident, the Nigerian child became an integral uh, participant in terrorism. This stems from the expansion of terrorism in Nigeria. On the 14th of um, April, 2014, 279 
girls were kidnapped in Chibok uh, Secondary School in the northeastern region of Nigeria uh, by the Boko Haram uh, terrorist group. This uh, incident was to create a shift, you know, in war strategy uh, of the insurgents. After that, other mass uh, kidnapped cases followed, and this caused uh, an upsurge in the spate of suicide bombings in the region. Now, active participation of children in terrorism is very explicit. In 2019, a report by UNICEF indicates that more than 3,500 Nigerian children were recruited by armed militants in Nigeria. This 2019 report was followed recently by a report made by the United Nations Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict in Nigeria. Since the, that since the inception of the armed group in 2009, up to 8,000 children have been recruited by the sect, including children as young as four years old. Now, children are recruited by Boko Haram insurgents for various reasons. Some of these reasons include to boost warfare strategy, one, then two, for recognition and also for economic empowerment. The context of warfare strategy is multiple. First, children are machineries used by terrorists um, to execute their plans. Since they could be easily indoctrinated, they are used as spies and suicide bombers in public gatherings such as churches, mosques, and other marketplaces, marketplaces and public spheres. Also, terrorist groups become more visible when they include children in their fold. For example, Boko Haram became more prominent uh, with the aftermath of the 2000 and, uh, 2014 kidnap of the schoolgirls in uh, Shibok Secondary School. The aftermath of this occurrence was the globally acclaimed Bring Back Our Girls movement, uh, which was established to pressure the Nigerian government into driving the rescue of the abducted school children. Below are pictorial depictions of uh, some of the abducted school girls. As we can see, the first and second picture fully capture some of the school girls uh, that uh, were kidnapped by Boko Haram insurgents, you know. And then, um, let's look at the context of economic empowerment. Uh, terrorism has become a lucrative enterprise. We are terrorists actually kidnap their victims uh, to get money from the government and from the relatives of their kidnapped victims. Boko Haram makes financial gains from kidnap of children and adults. Uh, there are various permutations that uh, Boko Haram insurgents are well paid, even better paid than uh, people in, uh, you know, by, than uh, workers, those who work with the government. And with that, uh, there are indications that there are people who would even prefer to, uh, to join uh, the terrorists, to work with them uh, for financial gains. Now, children provide ship warfare for terrorism as well. The availability of recruited children would reduce expenses accrued to recruiting adult members. They could be paid less for their services compared to monies that would go into uh, the pockets of adult members. Below are pictorial depictions of, train, of uh, uh, Boko Haram, of children being, uh, you know, uh, cajoled, being forced into uh, joining the terrorist group. The first picture and the second picture fully captures it. And the uh, third picture uh, fully captures children being recruited, being taught uh, how to use the rifle. And then the, the, uh, this picture, this pictorial depiction fully captures uh, children uh, being sent on various violent uh, missions. Let me proceed to the synopsis of the film 
produced in 2016 titled Some Visa. But I will be very unconventional in my presentation this morning. I would like to uh, show us a five minutes clip. Just five minutes. Okay. Of the movie. I'm begging you while I eat, Tima. The army center. It is 10 kilometers away. 10 kilometers. You know this. Our family, our brothers, Fatima, please, our parents. Fatima, please, Fatima. <laughs> the army. The Nigerian army, eh? be making me to be laughing. Eh? Eh? Ten kilometers away, eh? is that so? Ten kilometers away? And you think they will not be coming to be, to be helping you? You! Where are you running to? Look at where are you running to? Where are you taking my son to? Eh? Is it not you that the men were wanting to be cleaned that night? Is it not you that they were stoning? Blood is just all over your body, all over on top of your body, on top of the ground, everywhere. I am the only one that is saving you. I am the only one that is helping you out. Bring you back inside my house. Give life back to you. And you now want to be running away to leave me inside this bush. Eh? Where are you running to? If somebody was to take Abdul from your house, would you keep quiet? Hmm? Would you keep quiet? This is not Allah. This is not Islam. This is not Islam. Abdul, Muhammad will not command us like this. He will not command us like this. Two hundred and seventy-three girls. Two hundred and seventy-three girls. Zainab, Amina, Tosin, Lamre, Ola! My twin sister, Halimat. Where are they? Where are our girls? Bring back our girls! Bring back our girls! Bring back our girls! Abuga! Where did you take them? I want to know! Where are they? Where are our girls? Please! You want to kill me? Mm -hmm. You want to kill me? Mm -hmm. 
Anything is better than this. Hmm? Anything is better than this, Abubuka. Hmm? Kill me. I don't care. Kill me. Abdul. Abdul! Yes, yeah, Daddy. Shoot her. Shoot this girl, Abdul, eh? Shoot her, Abdul! Shoot her! Are you not hearing me as I'm talking to you? Shoot her! Shoot her, Abdul! Shoot this girl, Abdul! Shoot her, my sister! Can I be my sister? Abdul, shoot this girl! This girl is not walking the way we are walking! Shoot! Ah, Abdul! Shoot her! Abdul, what are you waiting for? Daddy, what are you waiting for? I said you shoot her! I gotta be shooting her! I gotta be shooting her! Abdul! 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 Now, we had a comment that um, he just made. He said, shooting her is executing uh, the work of Allah. Now, this is a major uh, problem with Isonjesi in Nigeria, where children are made to understand that being part of the terrorists, that is instilling terrorism in them, that carrying out orders, that is promoting the ideology of Boko Haram, uh, in, uh, of uh, the Boko Haram thing is a way of, you know, pitching tents with, pitching tents with Allah. According to him, he uh, claims that Allah allows, you know, uh, children, allows one to carry out, to execute uh, 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 missions or processes that counters Western education. And right there, he also captures, he also states that women are nothing in the society, that they should be treated, uh, uh, that they should be treated as best citizens, that they should be relegated to the background. Let's go on with it. Shoot her as he is commanding me to be commanding you. Shoot her! Shoot her! I cannot be treating my sister. <laughs> She is not your sister. Rukia. Rukia. Ah, do bilahi me na. Rukia. Rukia. What do I, Daddy? Daddy, why? What are you wanting to be said, eh? Speak, boy. Speak. Why are you killing the girls, all of them? You don't understand, eh? You don't understand. You're just small boy, eh? You're just a small boy. Why are you killing the girls? All of them. You, you are shouting on me. I shall be not mad. I shall be not mad. <laughs> if you are me, Abdul, if you are me, will you be bringing your girls into this kind of order? Eh? Will you be bringing your girls into this kind of world? <laughs> this world is not good for girls. This world eh? is not good for girls. Inside this world, men and boys will just be raping and useless in girls. Anyhow. Using them anyhow and anywhere they want. <laughs> this kind of world is not good for girls. Eh? Why with me? Why will I not bring my own girl into this type of world? Eh? Why? Why? It is done. The will of our light has been done. Let us be going home. This is happening again. Last night, the cancer. It is happening all the time now. So it's happening again last night. In the middle of the night, I wake up. Everywhere is wet. My shirt wet. 
It is not sweat. It is not urine. The next morning, it is dried up, running away from the sun. And the girls are wanting to be running away from you. Afraid. I am not washing my shirt with my own hand. Because I'm mean, that is my wife, I know. But I don't want her to be doing all the work for me. She's just a girl. That is how he's now coming back to me. And I'm starting to remember it. How it's happening the night from yesterday. So I'm remembering that there's another boy that I'm thinking about. When the cancer is happening in the night time. Is another boy that's making my two assists? What are you saying? What are you saying, Abdul? That's it. That's it. Will you shut up? That's why you're not going to do it. Abdul, 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 Fuck that baby! Where are you running to? Because of time, um, we are going to look at how Sambisa, this film, uh, fully uh, resists uh, terrorism, Boko Haram terrorism uh, in Nigeria. Now, the events in the film fully confirm that the child has been able to resist suppression and marginalization in the face of terrorism. The action of Abdul, who uh, uh, refuses to kill Rukayat, and that is, and also the female characters uh, in the last uh, action right in this film uh, uh, fully captures the fact that they try to resist, you know, uh, the ideology uh, of the ideology of uh, Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria. Now, Abdul is aware that he must be loyal to the terrorist group. He is aware of the oath he has actually taken never to betray the cohort. But within him, he seems to be conscious of the need for a change in the status quo. He is of the oppressive system of insurgency. Uh, he is critical of the oppressive uh, system of insurgency and the need for children to join forces against their oppressors. Hence, when Abubakar tells him to kill uh, Rukayat, Abdul refuses. Instead, he uh, resorts to uh, committing suicide than take orders uh, from uh, Mohammed. This realization seems to have been propelled by the banter between Rukayat and Mohammed. Now, conclusively, Sambisa decolonizes uh, a crude epistemology. 
That is the philosophy of founding Boko Haram on the framework of Islam is disrupted by the girls led by Rukayat who refuses that the incessant killings, the incessant rape and kidnappings by Boko Haram are not stipulated uh, in the Quran, that they are not stipulated by Allah and also not stipulated uh, by the prophet uh, Muhammad. Historically, the film art has uh, done, uh, gone beyond merely representing issues that border on terrorism. With the application of all required aesthetic elements, uh, film has the capacity to galvanize its audience into action, and particularly to be used as a tool uh, against uh, terrorism. Thank you. Thank you. A very powerful message from the film and the presentation. Uh, we now have 10 minutes uh, for questions. If you have any questions to any of our speakers, please raise the hand and we will bring the microphone over. Uh, just for Professor Evo, regarding your uh, presentation for spiritual literacy, um, I was wondering whether you have explored uh, the concept of children as intuitive theists, uh, with where there's the idea that young children are wired uh, towards uh, belief in a in a um, I suppose in an anthropomorphic way that there is a creator or a storyteller or a uh, a someone behind nature and whether perhaps there's a deprogramming that's happening through, you know, you had this early childhood part which was play, free play, but whether um, our kindergarten teachers, childcare settings don't have the language, the philosophical uh, understanding to be able to expand on this ability rather than perhaps de deprogram and suppress? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I have to say that the, the program which I used about the early childhood playing is from literature from USA and UK. So there is no specific program in Czech Republic, but I suppose it's really intercultural and international possibility how to use this, this program. And in Czech Republic, there is not a specific interest on this spiritual literacy. We have, of course, some, some church uh, schools and there is a religious way how to improve uh, children in this way. But I suppose there is open for understanding of deeper experience, but it's not, um, not, you know, very well established in a specific spiritual way. There are some programs for children, and there are some some uh, people who understand this necessity to improve child ch children in this way but it's not established like you know institution or something like that it's only on a personal interest of concrete individuals yeah, it's actually quite interesting that it's coming from the uk and us because that's the counter research yeah. uh, where the idea is that this affects uh, in early childhood is uh, making children less able to cope when things aren't logical yeah. and rash yeah. you know, yeah, exactly. because they're being uh, set up for rationality yeah. and it's closing uh, other possibility and other imagination. So that's really, thank but you if this. I can add something to it, sure. uh, there is uh, visible more uh, ways how to use spiritual practices in life not not specifically for children, but for adult generation, seek something which is more than only, you know, food and beer. So so something deep deeper experiences, and, and it's very very growing up in in my country, I suppose. Okay, if we oh another question. Yeah, thanks to uh, all three of you. It was a uh, pleasure to, to listen to you. 
uh, well, certainly very interesting to, to hear about these three very different uh, topics. And um, Stephen, I, uh, I have a, I'm interested in the film that, that you sent uh, or that you showed us a, a clip from. Um, could you tell uh, a bit about, if, is it a film that is being shown in, in cinemas or in television? Has it, has it uh, sparked some debate? Uh, is it seen as uh, a very political film that is commented on in the media? Um, has it changed opinions in, in Nigeria? Yeah, the film is, um, obviously, the film is a political film. You know, right in the northern region of Nigeria, the social structure is completely different from what it is in the southern region of Nigeria. Now, the first thing is, permit me to say that children, the rate of illiteracy in the northern region, especially where Boko Haram uh, insurgency holds sway, is higher than what it is in southern Nigeria, okay? And the basic uh, education structure in the north, um, it's the Islamic uh, education uh, approach, methodology, you get it, where they are taught the tenets of Islam. And then some of these uh, Islamic teachers are extremists. They are very radical, you know. In fact, children in the region, not only children, adults as well, they believe, they believe that um, when one goes extra mile for Allah, that is, uh, even uh, to the extent of killing someone, to fight for Islam, that if such a person is a man, such an individual, that there are about seven virgins, who, and he or she dies in the process, that there are about seven virgins waiting for such a man right in heaven. You know, such belief system uh, and practices and all of that. So this film specifically fully acts as a counter-response, a counter-discourse to some of these beliefs. Now, like Rukaya mentioned, uh, this is not the full movie. I only, uh, uh, you know, showed us uh, the last scene of the movie. Now, Rukaya enlightens Abubakar, uh, the lead terrorist in this film, that what Abubakar teaches, what he preaches, is not Islam, that it is not Allah. Now, Rukaya fully, capture, fully uh, uh, captures, uh, you know, should I say secular Islam? No, not really. I shouldn't use the term secular Islam. Let me say a less radical uh, sect of Islam. You get it? So this film was well uh, screened in Nigeria, and people as well in the northern region were made to see it. Yeah, as, uh, as a medium to teach the children, to facilitate enlightenment of the children and adults as well of what Islam really is. Uh, that is. That is it. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting on the discourses. You know, we have lots of different discourses in media, in films, in political uh, messages from different sources. Um, do we have a question for Professor Naumiuk about the devil child? It, yes? Okay. okay. I, ha I had one as well. <laughs> well, have you... Well, thank you for both, uh, for all three of you. This was life-changing because it opens up new possibilities for research and uh, understanding how things work in other contexts help us expand our knowledge. So I will definitely take that back to the university and talk to the kids. Kids, these guys. Uh, but uh, I would like to, to ask whether you've made some connection uh, between Jane Addams and the social gospel movement because um, I've studied it for briefly and I was highly interested in it and I was wondering whether you have any thoughts on, short thoughts about the, on the connection between her and the movement per se. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, I think it's interesting that uh, personalities and characters and activism 
uh, are built also uh, in the circumstances, in specific situations. And if it, it is true that she and John Dewey, for example, they were friends and they were uh, inter relating so she had made she was um, inspired by by his writings but he was also inspired by her work so if you read um, if you read his papers he can say learning by experience is also part of his understanding what Jane Adams was doing and how she learned so it is very interesting I think that uh, this uh, this movement uh, progressive movement is also uh, part of the American history, of course, uh, where things could happen that we try to, for example, replace models and we cannot do it because the situation is not the same. The environment is not the same. The spirit is not the same for, the, for moving things that it require not only one person. So I'm talking about Jane Addams, but there are many other uh, activists, man, many people who had their stories and their, um, their work. So I think that uh, the thing is that we should study also how people relate with each other, how um, our work uh, interrelates to, to the concept of change, where not only one person but the, the entire village uh, to raise one child is needed. So, um, so there were also difficult situations. I can tell you about quarrels of Jane Adams and, and her, um, like even Mary Richmond, right? Um, things that were uh, happening and still happen. So I think that um, the message is also to have the courage, but also have collaboration and have both uh, the, the researchers, the academia, and the practitioners work together for the change rather than have one or two ideas and make it by yourself. What a fabulous wrap up of this uh, part of the session and the, the interprofessional collaboration. That's what the Educatore project is about that we are hosting here at the moment. Um, so what we're going to do now, we're going to take a little break, uh, connect with our hybrid colleagues that are joining us online through a click meeting platform. Uh, there is coffee and biscuits and fruit available in the usual location. And I would like to invite you uh, to sign our 100 year anniversary book, because we have many anniversaries today. We are celebrating still the year of Maria Grzegorzewska and our 100 year anniversary, but also we'll be celebrating at 11.30 with a nice cake, at the birthday of the journal, International Journal of Social Pedagogy. So we're looking forward to it, and we welcome you to sign our book, to write a few words in your own language or in English, as you wish, or in French, or in any other language, please. Oh, here I am. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so we might just have to do it. Um, okay, now everybody seems to be able to come on. So that's yes. brilliant. Um, Laura, can you can you check if you're able to come on as well? Perfect. And you, how do you just want to check again if you click on the little camera symbol at the bottom of your screen? Where sh there, there should be like um, in the middle okay, of it. Okay, now everybody seems like to be able to come on. So the little icons, the um, left one should be a Laura, red camera can symbol. You, can you check if you're able to come on as well? Okay. Perfect. And you, how do you just want to check again if you click on the little camera symbol at the bottom of your screen? Okay, then I should be like whenever uh, in the middle of okay, now everybody likes like to be able to come on. So the little really icons, really the left one should be a red camera. Well, I'm going to have to confess I'm not able to come on as well. But I've got an apple. <laughs> Wait, I'll do it. Okay. Perfect. And you, how do you just want to check again if you click on the little camera symbol at the bottom of your screen? Okay, and I should be whenever like, uh, in the middle of okay, the day, now everybody likes to be able to come on. So, the little icons, the left one should be a red camera. Well, I'm going to have to be able to come on as well. But I've got an apple. <laughs> Wait, I'll do it. Okay. Perfect. And you had to yeah. just want to. We're ready. Again. Do you want if to introduce the little camera symbol at the bottom of your screen? 
Wait, okay, then I should be like whenever, in the middle of the okay, should be like be or to come on. So be the red icons, the um, left one should be a no, red no, camera. Oh, I'm gonna have to okay, Warsaw, Warsaw. Hello, hello. <laughs> we need to Wait, now no. think about the noise That's on the yeah, just run camera and the laptop. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, thank you coming back after the break. Um, we have our guests from other countries who are participating online, who represent the International Journal of Social Pedagogy, uh, which is celebrating the 10th year anniversary today. And I'll hand over to Gabriel in a minute, but first we're gonna light the candles on the cake. Okay. And so, um, we're going to maybe sing something. I don't um, know, Gabriel, do you suggest we sing something for the journal's anniversary? Online, who <coughs> the National <coughs> Journal of Social <coughs> Pedagogy. We'll see uh, how good the you have together then. So who would start? <laughs> okay, so someone brave. Come on, social pedagogues, you're brave kind. Pat, you're, I, you're very tall. I can't think of anything except happy birthday, and I don't know if everybody knows yes. that. It's appropriate, yes. In English, uh, but in English, yep. you let's go. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thanks. I'm just going to ask Martin, Dr. Martin Shostakovsky, to distribute the cake. Thank you. Okay, over to and Thanks. I got my daughter here. Given that this is a conference about childhood, I thought it's appropriate to bring a, a, a child. And um, she was not going to go anywhere else until the cake's been eaten and the candles have been blown off. So, Mila, over to you to blow out the candles. Very good. All right. Thanks. We'll look forward to eating the cake with you. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, and um, your colleagues for giving us this opportunity um, to celebrate um, the 10 year anniversary of the International Journal of Social Pedagogy. Um, I'm really grateful for, for this chance. I'm really delighted um, that you're all there in Warsaw. I hope you're having a great time. Um, no. Um, and I'm uh, delighted to talk very briefly about the journal itself and how it came came to be, and then to um, have a bit more of a conversation with um, everybody who's been joining us um, live from different places in the world uh, today um, in connection with the theme uh, around the diversity of social pedagogy. Um, so we started off the journal um, in, in a roundabout way um, without uh, so much of a plan to begin with. Um, but it all started to come together when we we hosted an event with IT Sligo here in Ireland uh, probably about 11 years ago. And uh, we're fortunate enough to um, uh, bring Juha Hammerlein over um, to present at the event. And after his presentation, um, he gave me his manuscript and said, um, if you have anywhere to publish this, um, feel free to do that. Um, at the time, we were um, grappling in the UK with the challenge of how to explain social pedagogy, how to connect theory and practice, um, and how to bring a, a social pedagogical perspective to practitioners in particular. And we really wanted to kind of deepen that understanding. Um, so we decided that actually let's just use the opportunity and uh, set up a journal, right? Um, and make this open access in particular so that uh, people outside of academia don't have to kind of struggle to uh, be able to access it, uh, but can just, you know, um, read the, the articles for free. Um, and given that we had a couple of um, <coughs> journal articles to begin with from uh, different um, academics, um, particularly in Scandinavia, we thought, why not call it the International Journal of Social Pedagogy, right? Um, so 
I got to, together with uh, Professor Pat Petrie, um, who at the time was very actively involved in social pedagogy research at the um, UCL Institute of Education and has <laughs> set up the Center for Understanding Social Pedagogy together with her colleague Claire Cameron. Um, and Pat very kindly agreed to be the co-editor. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, Pat, sort of looking back 10 years ago, why do you think it was important to have an English language social pedagogy journal at the time? Why does it seem relevant? Well, first of all, of course, Gabriel, you asked me, so it must have been re relevant. Um, Gabriel is a very good person for recruiting. Um, and it seemed highly relevant, in fact, because we were struggling with ideas about social pedagogy, with the introduction of social pedagogy. We had research going for more than 10 years uh, at that time, directly into social pedagogy for 10 years, but social pedagogy as a profession and a field cropping up in other European research that I was involved with at the time. And it seemed to me that the journal would help us, so selfish, help us, but also it would be a great place for ongoing academic exchange and opening a window on the theory and practice of social pedagogy in other countries. And it was a window that we were already opening at the Centre for Understanding Social Pedagogy, uh, we had regular, twice, sometimes three times yearly seminars, for example, uh, from other, with other colleagues. But this would somehow be a, a different form. It would widen that discussion to uh, beyond the academic field. And it would be a great opportunity for opening windows and doors on a range of ideas and ways of thinking, ways of practicing, value systems, and how they operate together. And um, so it just, it just seemed a very good thing to be part of at the time and to continue in a very uh, diluted way to be part of now. So I think that's, that's the, main, the main thrust of why I thought it was worthwhile uh, to promote the international journal uh, in, in UK circles, and that this was one way of doing it. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I wish a uh, congratulations on 10 years. Uh, it's, I think in some ways it's been, it's been very hard work, but there have been some brilliant uh, papers with contributions from practitioners and from uh, uh, researchers and academics. So it's a great mix. And i just like to wish the journal well, the next 10 years and beyond. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, that's, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I think as, as you mentioned, we've had, we've had <coughs> loads of really fascinating articles that we've been fortunate enough to publish, well, over 100 in the meantime, um, including from, I think, all of the um, people who are contributing to the session uh, today. Um, as I mentioned, um, Yuha's paper very much kind of started this off, got the ball rolling. Um, and even 10 years from now, it's still an article that is really highly relevant, I find, um, because it described um, this, this notion of social pedagogical eyes and um, the diverse understandings of social pedagogy um, and how social pedagogy responds to, to social issues. Um, so Yuha, I'm interested in your perspective now 10 years on um, Looking back, uh, what do you think, uh, what points from your article still hold 10 years later and what do you think has changed over the last 10 years? Yes, thank you. And unfortunately, my camera does not work. I, I, uh, I'm very sorry. But uh, yes, I was invited by Gabriel to a conference of uh, social beta development uh, network held in Sligo 
in 2012. And at that time, we discussed the need to set up an international scientific journal of social pedagogy. Uh, to my delight, I must say, I heard that Gabriel had already planned to found such a journal with some British colleagues. And the first issue of uh, International Journal of Social Pedagogy was published in the same year, uh, and uh, I was honored to write its first article. My article was entitled uh, Social Pedagogical Eyes in the Midst of Diverse Understandings, Conceptualizations and Activities. And it was built around the fact that the concept of social pedagogy is used in different ways, which easily leads to confusion. I pointed out that uh, different country-specific economic, social, political, and cultural factors influence the diverse use of the concept of social pedagogy. Uh, but uh, the diversity is also a consequence of the fact that interpretations of the concept are based on different perceptions of human nature, society, knowledge, and even morality. Uh, so the differences, I think, uh, concern both social pedagogy as a scientific discipline, a field of education, and a professional field. In the article, um, I, I emphasize that we need common denominators through which it is possible to build a universally valid theoretical foundation of social pedagogy. And uh, I must say, I still believe this mission. I think that uh, the mission should take place as an open, rational, argumentative, scientific discussion within the international scientific community of scholars of the field of social pedagogy, of course. I still think that social pedagogy should be developed as a science because only as a scientific discipline it does fulfill its place as the basis for the proper education as a professional field. So science and practice are connected. And uh, I see it like Paul Nator that everything in pedagogy follows from the philosophical foundation. If the philosophical basis of our educational thought is valid, then the practice is in order. If not, the practice is also somehow inappropriate. Therefore, we should primarily take care of soundness of philosophical basis. Uh, in addition, I, I see it important to be aware of the traditions and history of social pedagogy and to have a scientific debate on the underlying human and social perceptions. I believe that the debate on the history of ideas in the field helps us to gradually reach a reasonable consensus on the philosophical foundations and the nature of the corresponding practices. Uh, well, uh, 
In other words, we need a cosmopolitical perspective to provide a sound concept of social pedagogy. Such a, a perspective which rises as a universal conception about language, space and time and, and all national specificities and differences. Yes. And uh, in, in, in this case, uh, the notion of social pedagogy acquires the character of a general pedagogical theory, or in other words, uh, a general theory of social pedagogy. That's what we necessarily need. I also consider it important that social pedagogy is not seen as a collection of pedagogical methods and techniques, but as, as a way of thinking and a perspective on people, communities and society and, and the relationships between people and society in particular. I understand the core of uh, social pedagogical practice to be educational work that promotes the building of people's community connections and social relations. And uh, of course, also prevention and alleviation of problems in these. I do not think that social pedagogy has any pedagogical methods of its own. Each scientific discipline has and should have its own questioning, own research subject and own conceptual history. And uh, I tend to think that in social pedagogy, it is traditionally educational work in the broad field of social participation and integration. Although societies are different, I uh, think it is justified to consider the processes of human growth through which a person achieves uh, ability to social functioning, inclusion, participation as timeless and universal subject of research in social pedagogy. And, and uh, um, uh, similarly, these processes and the problems that people have in, in uh, uh, these processes are central to the practice of social pedagogical work. So they, they are both uh, subjects of research and uh, the social pedagogical work is uh, focused on these issues. Yes, and, and uh, if we think about today's world, uh, we know that children and young people, as, as well as a big number of adults, have a great difficulty growing up in today's societies and finding their place as a member of society. That is why we need social pedagogical thinking widely in all educational and welfare work. Uh, to face the problems. It follows that uh, social pedagogy should not be developed as uh, the basis of learning for just one professional group, but as a science that applies widely to all professional groups in the fields of education and well-being. Uh, and then one uh, point more concerning the internationalization of social pedagogy. Uh, 
I tend to think that the internationalization of social pedagogy is both facilitated and hampered by the fact that the interpretation of the concept has so many country specific features. Partly for this reason, social pedagogy does not have a clear theoretical basis and, and uh, practices. And uh, the practices in the field vary in terms of both education policies and professional titles. On the other hand, diversity is also a richness. But I think that it is appropriate to look for common denominators through which social pedagogy can be structured, structured universally. For myself, social pedagogy has always been a philosophical concept of education around which a special tradition of philosophical debate with its practical applications has developed. So, and I would like to uh, end my, my uh, speech to say, let this debate continue. And, and uh, uh, the International Journal of Social Pedagogy is an excellent tool for continuing it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Juha. Um, that, that's all really thought provoking. I think just to connect to what you were saying at, at the end, um, I would also highlight that one way in which we're trying to continue uh, the internationalization and the dialogue um, and the opportunities to learn from each other is through collaborating with other journals. So um, just to take this opportunity to not just promote the International Journal of Social Pedagogy, um, but to also say like, you know, any journals, any publications around social pedagogy um, are very valuable um, to the field. And um, we, we're continuing to work very closely with other uh, journals uh, devoted to social pedagogy as well, so that collectively and cooperatively, we can help uh, promote the discourse um, beyond the national boundaries that you alluded to as well. Um, I, I think we'll we'll pick up uh, many of the points you made um, in the in the discussion um, just now. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome um, our other contributors who who are going to um, explore. Uh, different aspects of of Yuha's uh, presentation just now and um, the paper he wrote. Um, so very quickly, Kara O'Neill um, is one of those. She's the co-president of the US-based Social Pedagogy Association and has been very instrumental to in international efforts to increase collaboration and learning through conferences and um, other events, um, including the creation of the Global Alliance for Social Pedagogy and Social Education. And she's currently doing her PhD at Leuphana University in Lüneburg uh, in Germany. Um, I'm also delighted to welcome Milena Oebring Hobzova, um, who is a researcher in social pedagogy at Palatsky University in Olomouc in the Czech Republic. And she's done lots of research, uh, particularly on language education of adult immigrants, um, but also on multicultural education and media literacy. Um, and together with some Polish colleagues, as well as some of her colleagues in the Czech Republic, she's currently analyzing the image of refugees on Czech and Polish Twitter news accounts during the first two months of the war in, in Ukraine. Um, also delighted to welcome Stefan Kungeter, um, who is a professor at the Eastern Switzerland University of Applied Sciences. Um, his research comprises a whole broad range of topics, uh, particularly around child and youth care, the professionalization of social pedagogy and social work, the transnationalization of welfare knowledge, uh, the history of the settlement house movement, and relational social theories. Uh, we've also got Laura Cobella Molina from the Autonomous University in Barcelona, uh, joining us from Spain, um, and she is conducting her PhD research on ethics applied to social education and social pedagogy through a relational perspective. So we'll hear more about uh, this, 
th this urgency and this importance of um, having a strong, sound philosophical foundation, which you have mentioned. Um, um, I'm also delighted that Adrian Schoon from Auckland University of Technology is joining us from New Zealand, where it's a Friday night. Uh, so I think it's cake o'clock for you, Adrian. Um, uh, his research uh, is focused very much on education access for marginalized communities. Um, he's developed New Zealand's first social education qualification, um, and he's currently got 100 students enrolled across the four courses on offer. Um, and he'll be telling us a little bit about their perspectives as well. Um, and last but not least, um, I'm also delighted to welcome uh, Lotte Harbo uh, from VIA University College in Aarhus in, over in Denmark, um, who's doing plenty of interesting research um, um, on the meeting between social pedagogy and the people that social pedagogues seek to help. Um, and Lot has also been um, very much involved in the early stages of promoting social pedagogy in the UK about 15 years ago. Um, so, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, the first theme we want to we want to connect to is to do with social issues. So, as you have mentioned um, and wrote extensively in his article, um, social pedagogy seeks to respond in an educational way to the social issues that it finds. And of course, those issues are in many ways unique to each country and each time. Um, but increasingly also, um, they're, they're very common uh, at a meta level uh, across, uh, across the globe, really. So issues like income inequality, um, uh, displacement through conflict, uh, deprivation, um, and so forth are, are issues that might look very differently in different countries, but are certainly um, well known wherever you go. Um, so this is one of the things we'd like to explore first. Um, now, what we'd like you to do in the audience is to contribute to a word cloud via menti.com. Um, so if uh, you can take your phones out, to www.menti.com and enter the code 85126477, then you'll be able to just tell us um, your brief perspective of what are the most pressing social issues that we're called upon to respond within the social professions. Okay. Whilst uh, you're doing that, um, and all of this will end up in a, in a beautiful word, word cloud, I'm very mindful that um, over the last two days, basically, um, you all in Warsaw will have had plenty of discussion about what are some of the key social issues we're facing at the moment. Um, so I'm delighted to, to hear a little bit from Anna um, just now about yeah, what, what's been the conversation at the conference with regards to this question? Anna, are you there? Anna, for some reason, I can't see you or hear you at the moment. Um, Okay. We are talking about social pedagogy, social education. Uh, we had um, excellent keynotes yesterday that can be observed on our YouTube channel of our Maria Grzegorzewska University. And this morning keynotes are also available there, so you can um, uh, check it out. There were some very powerful uh, messages coming from professionals from around the globe. Uh, we had a very passionate speaker yesterday that everyone is still talking about, Professor Derek Smith from the University of San Francisco, talking about school justice, discipline, discrimination, very powerful messages uh, from and a reflection from that presentation. Uh, we had uh, uh, Dr. Thor Bernd Sorensen uh, from Denmark discussing um, teachers, 
situation in different countries and the issues of social inclusion. Um, we had Professor Rudy Roos talking about the discourses on children's rights. Uh, we had Professor Mahesh from India talking about Ayurveda medicine and the philosophy of Ayurveda and how it connects to social environments uh, from a very old tradition uh, of Indian culture. Uh, we had Professor Vishnya Rajic uh, from um, uh, Zagreb University in Croatia uh, telling us about the best friends and how COVID-19 uh, defined best friends ideas, whether it was uh, possible to make friends online or was it more difficult and in which age groups reported what issues related to having friends and best friends. Um, and this morning we had Professor Ivo Jurasek from Czech Republic uh, talking about spirituality as a, as a, as a concept in, in, uh, in social pedagogy and as a challenge in, in the Czech context, uh, followed by a powerful presentation by Professor Agnieszka Naumiuk. Uh, talking about um, at the beginning of 20th century America and the perception, the cultural perception of disability in some uh, groups of migrants. And then at the end we had um, a presentation by Stephen Okpada from Bowen University in Nigeria telling us uh, about uh, the child terrorism as a form of child participation. Uh, so quite an array of uh, powerful speakers yesterday and today. I thank them all for, for, the, for the contributions. And we were really looking forward to the discussion on what social pedagogy is and hoping that you will also uh, say a few words about the journal, which direction is it going, uh, what uh, special issues can we expect. And we are very eager to know um, about the board <laughs> and so on. I don't know what that was. <laughs> So maybe I ha had, had a hand over to you, back to you. Uh, we are expecting Professor Claire Cameron this afternoon um, to open the online sessions at uh, one o'clock UK time, two o'clock uh, Central European time where Warsaw is located. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anna. That sounds like you've had a really exciting conference and touched on, on many important issues um, affecting uh, children uh, in particular, but also more widely professionals supporting children, young people and their communities. Um, so I'm curious to see if we could um, screen share the word cloud um, that you guys have been working on, um, if that is possible. what you all have added. Um, so we see a lot there about diversity, poverty, individualism, institutionalization, discrimination, um, and a lot more on there. Um, so I'd like to just invite Kara O'Neill um, to maybe pick out one and give, give us your flavor of what are the most pressing social issues that we're trying to support people with. So this is kind of what brought me to social pedagogy is, is, is almost all of these, is this idea of increasing growing uh, social issues. And, and it's not that we have any more social issues now than we did 200 years ago, but we certainly present them differently. And arguably social media has had a, a, a huge hand in that. But what really speaks to me is this word individualism, because I, I kind of dabble a lot of my research in this concept of individualism and how it really affects us. So to hold that word in your mind for a minute, to really talk about social issues pressing on social pedagogy, we, we kind of land in every social issue and that becomes really, really major and difficult. And what you have said about coming together to find sort of a general theory of social pedagogy struck me. And that, that really is kind of why we do the journal, right? And why we all write our articles and send them into central places, not just one journal, but to two journals, or why we have journals, or why we have global institutes, why we have the international federations that we have, why we're building global alliances. But it all comes down to this idea of, of what 
individually, we, as the writers of these articles, as practitioners, what we see as being needed in society and, and what societies individually see as being needed. And this work, it's really, really kind of a, a touchy word among different cultures. But when we delve into these social problems or the social question or the social issues, however you prefer to phrase that, you really land on these ideas that are sort of perpetuated by the UN of these three major areas of kind of social problems, which are social inequalities. Um, that is, that would be the differences in social statuses. It's the differences in positions in life. Um, it can be social or economic equality or inequality. They're all very strongly connected in this overarching idea of social inequalities. But that encompasses also this political inequality where some people have a voice and some people don't. And a lot of our research follows that idea of having a voice, giving a voice, enabling spaces for voices. And we move right into sustainability issues, right? When we talk about who has a voice and who doesn't have a voice, we can't help but talk about environmental inequality, uh, unequal distribution of resources, unequal control of risk hazards, unequal understandings of sustainability, unequal efforts um, for sustainability. And those are all really big ways of saying we're living on the same rock, right? And we're all on this same planet and we all individually will assign different ideas and concepts to these words, but we're all going to land at this place where these are some issues that we might need to look at. So the only thing I really, when I was thinking today about what to share or why why this journal to me personally becomes so important, I started to think kind of about these spaces where we can go into these areas and I can see maybe, you know, what Dr. Petrie or Dr. Kungita or, or what, I would say Dr. Corbella, I almost said Laura, sorry, Laura, we're colleagues anyway. <laughs> But what, what each of you believes, and everybody that's in the audience today, what each of you thinks, these are these areas that are so important for these journals in which, in which they must exist, or these online areas where we can move sort of out of our echo chambers. Um, the Pew Research Center in 2021, who tries very hard to be a nonpartisan research center, did a survey, a since the pandemic survey on division, and they found that in America, which if you can hear by the accent, I'm American, but I live in Germany, they found that 88% 80, of those in America surveyed really identified a, a real gap, a growing division in their society since the pandemic, specifically since the beginning of Corona. And that was more than 3000 people surveyed. So it's, it's a, a significant survey. And then in the Netherlands, Germany, and Spain, there were eight out of 10 people said, oh, we, we are really seeing some diversity or some division and, and really starting to go into our own sort of pods since the pandemic, since we sort of began to close off ourselves intentionally for safety, um, for health reasons. In Japan and South Korea also reported heavier divisions. But this is where it gets interesting because Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore in this massive survey did not. The majority of respondents in each of those countries reported more unity. So there is something there, something that's happening, um, that's kind of producing a different sort of outcome just from this pandemic, right? And I don't want to stick and stay on the pandemic. But what I do want to say is that moment in time, whatever that is, what that magic piece is that those respondents, whether it's who was polled and who responded, or whether it is something cultural or something inherent in those particular spaces, these, these are the reasons we need these discussions, right? This is what makes social pedagogy so beautiful, the study of social pedagogy, the sharing of our ideas. Um, and it goes back to that kind of, kind of idea of what is this country, this place, or this person who's responding seeing or doing or understanding and how do we share that information of course we can share it online but i think i think things like the international journal um and the global alliances and the international federation of social workers all of these things we're bringing together are just just a beautiful way to sort of 
produce a little of that diversity, kind of offer that up, make that more accessible um, in a controlled environment, which I think can be really important. So I don't know, social issues is such a huge, it's such a huge thing to talk about in such a small amount of time. But I think this is a really interesting word cloud and I hope you'll keep adding things as you think of them because this idea of poverty being directly above individualism, there's something really powerful to me about word clouds. So I, I can't speak well off just the top of my head just now looking at it, but ooh, and there's individualization twice. So I don't, that's kind of where yeah. I'm standing right now on this. Great, thanks Kara for your thoughts. And I think there's also something to say about that these, these, still, these different social issues don't just neatly intersect in different people's lives, but sometimes they culminate and create much bigger um, yeah, impacts on individual people. So they, these social issues, as you say, don't exist in isolation for people. Um, and so that's why as a profession, we need to really kind of pay attention to, to all of them at once in that sense. Um, and explore how they play out in individuals' lives in, in the communities that we're supporting as well. Um, I think what, one of the things that obviously we have also seen um, amidst those social issues is that every now and then uh, we see pockets of kindness and solidarity. And I think um, particularly this has come out in, in the response in Poland and other Central European countries to the um, to the war in Ukraine and the the influx of, of people escaping um, this conflict um, in particular. Um, so I'm interested uh, to hear a little bit more from Milena just now about um, how Czech society is coping with the huge number of Ukrainian refugees. Um, thank you a lot. Hello, everybody from Olomouc, Czech Republic. Um, thank you also for putting uh, Ukraine war um, on the list, because it's a real issue that I think social pedagogy um, can help us with, uh, especially how to integrate refugees, how to prevent from xenophobia and racism in the societies that accept these people. Uh, when it comes to Czech Republic, um, this country uh, has been very uh, much uh, solidar with uh, Ukrainian refugees in comparison to the European migration crisis 2015. So far, uh, according to the estimation, um, uh, there have been or oh, there are in Czech Republic around more than 300,000 war refugees from Ukraine which is a massive influx of people for a country with uh, 10 million inhabitants. And the Czech majority has been very helpful and um, the, the majority approves of the help and also the sanctions against Russia. And um, what the government um, approved of is a document called Strategy of Priorities when it comes to Ukrainian uh, war refugees. And the idea is to integrate and enroll people in formal education, uh, kids in formal schools by the 1st of September. But the question of course is uh, if the schools or how the schools are prepared for this, because there will be again, a huge amount of kids from a uh, different language background and often with traumas coming to classrooms. And therefore, um, the Association of Social Pedagogues and the Association of Educators in Social Pedagogy are pushing re really a lot to uh, sanction the position of a school social pedagogue, because uh, we believe that this position and this profession would help normal schools to cope with uh, this new situation. What I believe is uh, that social pedagogy can play a major really role in uh, prevention, not only working with the youth and children, but also focusing on active citizenships. And it doesn't matter how old the people are, if it's kids or adults, because I believe that especially in this time we are living, it's very important 
to make people be interested in human rights, in what's happening around me, not to be completely just closed up in my own bubble and I understand that um, I can help somehow uh, just to prevent from injustice. And I also think that social pedagogy can be a good instrument in uh, uh, preventing from uh, disinformation, distinguishing what's a fact, what's a hoax, because um, uh, social media uh, play really a very important role in our lives. And um, I think uh, really like working with people, educating them, really be making them become more active is a way how we can really um, make things better and well, even help the others. So. Thanks very much, Milena. And uh, I, I can concur with you. I think that your, your work there shows very clearly how um, specific crisis calls upon us as social pedagogues to, to respond very quickly, very immediately, and from a position of human rights. Um, and yes, it, it touches upon many, many of the the arguments that you have Hermeline and has put forward in, in the article as well. Um, and it just shows that we we need that diversity because the particularly the, the war in Ukraine, um, whilst it has affected uh, lots of communities, lots of countries, um, it has done so in very unique ways. Um, and so we need we need to have this diverse response as well as the the opportunity to learn from each other um so this brings us very nicely to the second theme of Yuha's article which is around uh diversity uh, and diverse understandings of social pedagogy um because we need to look at the different histories the different cultural contexts in which social pedagogues work um and social pedagogy traditions themselves as you have mentioned have show the characteristics um, of the different countries, the different histories. Um, and so they're, they're necessarily diverse. Uh, I'm curious to hear a little bit more now about what the implications of this diversity are and how we might be able to learn from each other and with each other, importantly. Um, so I'm delighted to, to invite Adrian Shelley about um, the work in um, yeah, his part of the world in New Zealand in particular. Uh, kia ora and um, hello from New Zealand. Yeah, I'm on. Right, so I speak to you from the future here um, in Auckland. But just um, thank you, and I'm going to um, just share briefly. Now, New Zealand doesn't have a tradition of a named social pedagogy but when we talk about the key attributes, the philosophies and practices of social pedagogy, I can say that we do have a rich history, albeit by other names. And by the way, I met Pat about seven years back, who impressed upon me that my work that I was doing with tutors and alternative education was indeed socially pedagogic. In fact, an early article in the International Journal of Social Pedagogy centered on a, con a Māori concept of aroha, which is love. As social pedagogy discourse permeates um, through the world, it finds cultural and indigenous resonances that expand our understanding of social pedagogy and deepens our connections together as a global community. So if I could just have that slide up, Anna, that you had before. I want, to share, I, I, I want to share with you, with the permission of a student, a few images from an assignment I set my social education students, and I asked them um, to choose a visual metaphor that to them represented social pedagogy. Now, Mariana chose this image of a pikoda, which is a Māori greenstone pendant. And as you can see, she's put... Um, some attributes of social education around the pendant. And she explains, the twist of the pikorua represents an eternal bond between people and culture. I believe the pikorua is an appropriate symbol to use for social education 
the key principles are placed around this tawonga, or treasure, as the pikaurua was crafted to symbolize an endless chain, which means that each of these principles can relate back to one another. And just the next image um, from this kind of visual metaphor assignment, um, if we could just move that on. On to the next slide, thank you. Oh, if we could go back. <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, and so I've got two other metaphors here. Emeline Latu likens social pedagogy to a Tongan carver bowl. Now, Tonga is a small nation in the South Pacific, and there are a lot of Pacific people that live in New Zealand. A special drink is made in this bowl, which people partake of. Um, communally while they um, are talking with each other and building relationships. Now, Emmeline liked the four legs of the carver bowl to four aspects of social pedagogy. And she talked about the four legs for her being listening and communication, relationships, child development, and reflection. It is these four principles to her that support the child or young person supported by the pedagogue. And finally, just on the right hand side there, you'll see that there is the cloak, a cloak, which is a, a, it's an artwork um, of a cloak, a Māori cloak or a kākahu. And the image um, in each, the students in an alternative education centre each put a feather on this particular cloak. But a student said that this represented for her social pedagogy, which, um, because the cloak is used to physically embrace somebody metaphorically and encapsulates social pedagogy for its weaving, weaving journey. Um, the weaving of relationship, the care and attention to craft and detail, the collaborative effort, the cloak, a symbol for manaki or care. So, you know, just um, in conclusion, these few metaphors provide us with culturally nuanced interpretations or lines of flight that impress upon us to embrace new horizons for social pedagogy across the globe. And so I've been so, um, I've learned so much from my students in terms of how they can imagine social pedagogy within their own cultural lenses. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Adrian. Um, that's really fascinating, and it speaks to this idea of social pedagogical eyes, and that we we can these perspectives in in so many corners of the world, in so many com communities. Um, and I also really like your point about I think the the importance that we give voice to to those communities that we don't often hear that we we're able to promote their active citizenship um, and to, to promote their opportunities to be heard um, because they have so much to contribute, I think, and um, really show the richness that comes from diversity if we pay attention to that. Um, I'm curious now to, to hear from Stefan, who's done a lot of work on historical and social contexts for social pedagogy and um, why we need to pay careful attention to those um, and how all of this is linked to diversity. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. I wasn't sure about the microphone. Um, so thank you. Yes, and um, Adrian, wonderful pictures um, um, and very moving as well. And um, I thought it's interesting to see that there is a double translation. First of all, that's a translation of between different cultures that they are involved and the meaning of and the idea of social pedagogy. And the other translation that I see here is also very interesting because it is a materialization of an idea that we can see here. And I think that's very important also for our understanding that all the theories and concepts that we are talking about materialize in, in kind of organizations, in, in, in all kind of products that we create uh, as professionals or as professionals together with our um, 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 clients. Um, so I think it's very important uh, to understand these uh, translations and that brings me to my point. Yeah, um, 
um, when I did research on the history of social pedagogy or social work, I would say, or social professions, um, I saw these, um, I saw these, I had a very close look at these translations of different ideas, which, which are important. But let me start with one personal note. Um, when I started studying um, educational sciences and then focusing on social pedagogy in Germany, uh, it is kind of difficult to um, get a perspective from the outside because what I was told always was that Germany is the center of social pedagogy. And, um, you know, um, um, as German, you, you may be suspicious if you hear something like that in Germany, that uh, Germany is kind of a center for something. Um, and But I, I really worked on this only later when I, I, when I realized that also in Germany, you know, if you want to become a very important scholar in social pedagogy, you have to have your own paradigm, not about consensus, but about paradigms and concepts that are very important. So I was very suspicious of these things as well. And um, I started to uh, try to understand what was going on um, when I was working on the history of the settlement house movement. Um, and therefore I went to, to Canada where almost nobody understood was what social pedagogy was or is until I met Daniel Sugarensky at the U of T. Um, and um, yes, so I was working on the settlement house movement. And interestingly enough, um, most of the history work on the settlement house movement is it's about social work history, right? And um, what most of the people do not know is that the settlement house movement very much influenced also the social pedagogy tradition in Germany uh, in, a, in, a various, in various ways. We have very conservative uh, translations of the settlement house idea into social pedagogy, but also very socialist and progressive, I would say. Um, and and that, that was my, what, that was my, when I came thinking about why do we don't recognize some of these histories of social pedagogy? Why do we emphasize Paul Nartop, for example, but nobody uh, talks about Friedrich Sigmund Schulze, who was close to the idea of Nartop and translated the settlement house movement into the social pedagogy idea. Or Alex Westerkamp, we have also a gender problem issue here that most of the social pedagogues we refer to in Germany are men, but what about the women who very much influenced the social pedagogy idea? And also you can see also connections between Ali Salomon, who was always on the side of the social work history, but never on the side of the social pedagogy history. Why is that? She was very much involved in, I would say, social pedagogy ideas. And all these kind of things which disturb our idea what social pedagogy means brought me to think about a little bit more in detail about that. And what, what I found really intriguing when I was working on the settlement house movement, the origin is always located in the UK and in the US. And what, what we neglect here is that in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the uh, 20th century, we had a large reform movement, which was very much influenced by social policy ideas from Germany. And um, social policy, for example, I think is also very important to see these connections. And we have to see that all the social movements that are also involved, like the women's movements, the socialist movements, also the Christian socialists, the bourgeois uh, kind of youth movements, and so on. And that's very important. And last point, very important, which was not in the world cloud. Um, the whole focus there, the common denominator was community. And the community was very much influenced by the idea of the nation. And if we want to talk about the, social, the future of social pedagogy, I would say we have to think about community and solidarity beyond our common understanding of, or the old fashioned understanding of community, which is very much thought about 
boundaries of communities. But we, I think we have to really open up on uh, a much broader perspective on solidarity across communities in that sense. Thanks, Stefan. That's a great point um, because it links very nicely back to we're, we're all on this planet together. So this idea of we, we are a whole human um, and eco-social community in that sense and the importance that we also extend our thoughts not just to our narrow physical community that we might be part of, uh, but actually to the wider globe, the wider ecosystem that we're part of um, is really important. And I think it really shows then the, the opportunities for diversity. Um, I'm curious to hear a little more now about Laura's research in particular, um, because she's been looking at um, the, the diversity um, in, in practice and to the extent to which um, there's an ethical purpose, a uh, clear uh, philosophy that perhaps connects some of the diversity. Um, so Laura, over to you. Well, thank you to give me this opportunity to share with, with you all of the, um, what I've learned these years uh, about ethics and, and, and which uh, paper has diversity on, on this axiological approach. Uh, so I, I have to apologize for my English. If there's something that I need to repeat, please uh, let me know. Uh, well, uh, what I wanted to, when, when I think about diversity, what I've learned these years about uh, reading theories, uh, reading philosophy, and also asking professionals and people they support, is that, well, diversity is a reality. In social pedagogy, in social education, we have our own roots, we, we have our own traditions, approaches, characteristics, but it's also that we have in, in common as an ethical purpose. And I say that because uh, diversity is something that we value in social pedagogy. No, uh, it's something that uh, going to using the theories of valuation of John Dewey, for example, is something that we could say that we appreciate. No, and and of course this has an this is a value for us and has an ethical implication and, and ethical apl applications to relationships and and the way we connect to to each other. So. Uh, the John Dewey's theories uh, invite, uh, invite us to evaluate why, why we appreciate this, uh, this value, why, why we appreciate this diversity, what we, why we think that is important. And, and we can do so this to, uh, by looking how, how we put this in, into practice, no? uh, how, how is the diversity applied. And, and the first, the first thing I, I would say is that we can understand diversity as a way of looking at realities. Diversity allow, allows us to, to open our mind to the different realities, to the different individualities and complexities you know, that every per person and, and every context present, and helps us to, to place ourselves in an equilibri equilibrated role of power so we can recognize others. Uh, we can recognize diverse ways of thinking, of feeling, of acting, no? and with that, with this recognition, we can give acceptance, and this leads us to promote equal relationships. And this, this diversity, well, the second point is that this diversity sets our minds to, to, to give to plan better actions and to give adequate responses, no ethical responses, responses to necessities and desires that of people of context, no, or hopes and our uh, fin finality. Well, I don't know how to say in English. Uh, it finally it helps us. It helps us to connect between us and and to lead between us and give us new opportunities to transform realities. Uh, so, looking, looking in that way, looking through diversity and responding through diversity, 
allow us to to create a scenario that ensures this equal participation I was talking and gives us gives uh, sorry it gives space to to all the voices to be listened and and has reci reciprocal relationships no and and this is actually a, a great opportunity to live and grow together and work for the world we want. So it, the, because of that, I think this is, uh, it has this ethical purpose, no? It helps us to, to, to work together. So Darwin, in, in his theory of evaluation, says that the utopia, utopia uh, is, a, is a scaffold that, that helps us to build, to build a, a better world. So, well, I would say that diversity, the value of diversity with, with, with other ones, is one of the pieces that make up this, this, this scaffolding. No? So we really need to appreciate it and, and to put it in practice through this mindset, through these responses, and through these scenarios. Thanks very much, Laura. And um, I, I really like the, your, your point around ethics um, very much reminds me of Yuha's insistence that social pedagogy is not about methods. Because very often in the UK, in particular, when we talk to practitioners, it's all about like, oh, can you just tell me which methods to use? Can you just give me a handbook that tells me what, what to do in practice? Um, so I think the focus on ethics gives us an opportunity to kind of really bring it back and ground social pedagogy in this philosophical orientation of like, what are our, you know, what, what is our understanding of human nature? How do we encounter people as equals? How do we place importance on human rights and solidarity? How do we focus on building meaningful, authentic relationships with the people we support? Um, and that by necessity, as you say, uh, needs to be a di diverse, a unique response to each individual that we meet um, that reflects the unique characteristics of me as the practitioner and the other person that I'm supporting. Um, so we've talked a lot about diversity in that sense. Um, I'm also curious now to hear more from Lotta, um, who's focused a lot on, on these aspects in, in your writing. Um, and you've talked a lot in your writing about the, the tension fields that we need to navigate as social pedagogues. So how do we, how do we still kind of come up with a sense of unity uh, amidst all that diversity or coherence perhaps? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for all your inputs so far. It's really inspiring, I think. Um, well, just to briefly just uh, set the context. I'm a, I'm a trained social pedagogue myself and have my practitioner years in that sense, in fact, with um, young people in care. Um, and in this very diverse field um, that uh, we agree that social pedagogy is, I somehow for the last 25 years just have constantly had sort of an ongoing reflection. So. On, as to so what could we say unites us why is it when we enter an organization um, that we sometimes feel or perceive it as social pedagogical what is it that's sort of social pedagogical um, and uh, these years I'm an associate professor here in uh, Via University College and uh, I practice continuing education and together with the students here um, we are looking a bit at Nicholas Luhmann, so a German again, <laughs> um, as towards, so what is the function? What can actually sort of unite our reflections in education that we are, we are obliged to relate it to practice constantly in, in the sort of legislation we, we teach according to? And somehow the idea of a social pedagogue or the social or social pedagogy as having a common aim or a common navigation point that's about helping or supporting or enabling helpful coupling possibilities in society, in contexts, in communities that the young person or the adult or whoever we, we meet and society finds fruitful. Um, and 
to this point, I'm 47 now, and I've got 30 years left in, in uh, as a as an associate professor, probably. But here in my academic life, I suggest that uh, this idea of constantly having a reflection on so what do we actually see as a helpful coupling possibilities, uh, coupling uh, possibility for for the human being that we meet, and we look into that together with the human being. That's quite fruitful, I think. And it's, um, I met a, um, a social pedagogue recently who is, uh, she's working in a horse assisted practice. And uh, she just gave me such a brilliant example because this whole idea of her meeting a young girl, um, this young girl, she hadn't been to school for like, I don't know, half a year or so. And, um, and that girl, she had an interest in, in horses. And um, she was allowed to start in this horse assisted practice. And we all know that you need to go to school. And uh, as it's been sort of said and also underlined by Yuha, the education part of social pedagogy is, is quite important. So this girl, she hates school, but she loves horses. And it's a classic example of how you can actually together, the social pedagogue and the young girl and the teacher can sort of find ways to actually participate in the schooling system because then all the reading became uh you know the idea of reading about horses all the math classes became about you know measuring out how much hay does a horse this size need and all that and you see in that sense this social pedagogue becomes the link to a coupling to the schooling system and instead of I'm not a, a opposed to relationships and all that, but it's just social pedagogy, in my view, inspired by Lumen, is a function in society that's supposed to help people to the next steps in life. Um, so it's not the re relationship with me as a social pedagogue is important, but the, the, the aim in itself lies in the future. Um, so. My idea, and we can discuss it from now on and forever, but that's this whole idea about um, maybe we can, yeah, find a common ground in looking into, so what is actually the helpful coupling possibilities that we see together with the young person or the adult or the child or whatever. So, yeah, that's it for me. That's, thanks very much, Lotta. That's a that's a beautiful example, and it really articulates so well. Like the, again, the ethical dimension and how we how we facilitate that process, because it would be all too easy to kind of say like you can only go horseback riding if you go to school regularly, but actually to look for what can we do with the young person in a way that helps them build the agency um, and develop this this excitement about you know the the necessary functions in society the necessary institutions that that we all need to go through is is something that comes again back to this philosophical purpose that we have um i think it also really shows for me that uh social pedagogy is inherently about hope about helping people get a sense of hope when they're at the bottom or when they feel like they they've been excluded they've been marginalized they're not part of society and might struggle to to find find a way back um in order to be able to do that with the people we support it's also really important i think that we sustain that sense of hope for ourselves as a profession um so what i would like to invite you all in the audience to do is to go back to menti.com and uh, contribute uh, to another um, another kind of um, illustration of the different things that you hope as a profession. Okay. Um, so the the code is the same. It's at the very top of your screen, and. Um, we're going to see in a moment um, what what that looks like. In the meantime, uh, whilst you guys are hopefully typing away um, any ideas of where do we draw hope from, um, I'm curious, Adrian, you have asked your students that very question. 
I'm curious what they've said. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wonder if I could have that photo, Anna, the last one in that. Mm, yep, thank you. So um, these are my students, on uh, some of my students um, from a lecture yesterday, and I asked them the same question, how to sustain hope in a world which is full of challenges environmentally, economically, and as we are aware, um, geopolitical tensions. They talked about self-care. How are you looking after yourself? You cannot hope to support others if you do not first care for your own well-being. They talked about reaching out and uh, reaching out to others and asking, "Are you okay?" And they also talked about keeping on learning and continuing to be curious in the world. But for me, though, hope for the social pedagogy profession is represented by this photo, but not me, this photo of these students, new generations of intelligent, thoughtful, caring professionals who bring new perspectives to the work, who are enthused about making a difference in the care profession. It is therefore important for the discourses of social pedagogy and publications like the International Journal for Social Pedagogy to thrive in order to support these students in our work, to support us all in our work as professionals, academics, researchers, and policy makers. And, you know, I put, I put it there that the International Journal of Social Pedagogy fosters hope. And in places where social pedagogy is emergent, like in New Zealand, um, you know, um, uh, the hope comes by reading those that have gone before us too and to chart pathways of, uh, you know, who have, you know, have forged path, conceptual pathways and practice pathways for us to follow. And that gives us hope for our journey. So um, that's my little contribution to hope. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adrian. Love to there as well. Thanks. And thanks uh, to your students as well for their thoughts, um, which are, yeah. Brilliant. Um, Milena, you have got uh, quite a number of students as well. Um, and I'm curious about their perspective. What gives you hope? What gives them hope? Uh, uh, thank you, Adrian, for the photo, because when I saw it, it's my students too. Uh, young people who want to go out to the world and make a change. And that's what gives me hope. And um, something for the International Journal of Social Pedagogy, because I'm in the middle of examining my students in the course of social pedagogy, and I always motivate them to read articles, not in Czechoslovak, but in English, German, or other languages they speak. And I recommended them the International Journal of Social Pedagogy. And what they do is they come with really articles from International Journal of Social Pedagogy. So not only experts, but even students of social pedagogy read our International Journal of Social Pedagogy. And that what gives me hope because I see people who will be interested in making the difference in practice and also having a good theoretical base for what they will do in life. Thank you. Thanks very much, Milena. That's that's really wonderful to hear. And um, yeah, I'm delighted that your students find the International Journal so relevant. Um, th that's one of the things that, that is certainly um, the key driver for me over the last 10 years of co-editing um, the journal is the, the kinds of contributions that show that despite the um, sheer insurmountable uh, social issues that we have, despite that diversity, um, there are real opportunities to to learn with each other, uh, not to copy what other people are doing, um, but to think about within the context of what I'm doing, what might I be able to learn from this? How can I draw hope, um, confidence, um, a greater sense of resourcefulness from that? Um, and as long as we kind of continue to to have that perspective, as long as we continue to have these opportunities for, for dialogue and exchange and um, inspiration uh, across boundaries, um, across borders, um, there, there's definitely hope um, from my perspective. Um, 
I'm also very curious um, uh, if we can see the result of the Menti just now to find out what you all in the audience felt gives. And have we got any contributions? No, not yet. Okay, I will leave you with that question to reflect on your way back, perhaps after the conference, what gives you hope as a professional. Um, and feel free to just add that at any point um, so that we can share this later. Um, because ultimately it is about what keeps us going. Anna, I can see you've got your hand up. Yes, we have contributed. Uh, so I hope that it will, it will be available later for us as a link um, where we can find uh, the, the contributions. I think it's just some sort of, uh, you know, the, li the little the little IT things that happen unexpectedly, but yes, we have contributed and we will really enjoy getting a link to, to see later the cloud that was made up from this from this session. Thank you okay. once again. Brilliant, thanks very much. Um, so one, one of the questions you had asked, um, which connects kind of nicely to Hope, was about the direction of the journal. Um, we have currently two special issues um, in in the process of uh, yeah being being uh, issued over the next uh, year or so. Uh, one is on social pedagogy and anti-terrorism and anti-extremism. So again, a very fascinating, uh, very topical uh, kind of reflection and uh, presentation of what's happening um, in this particular area. How do we? Um, support uh, people who might might have been um, groups in the past and want to um, find a way out. Um, we've also got a special issue uh, titled When Social Pedagogy Goes to School, which will focus on that uh, connection between social pedagogy and uh, formal education. Um, and um, that's being guest edited by Daniel Sugaransky and his colleague, uh, Terry Bartlett from Arizona State University. Um, and we're always open uh, for new ideas uh, for special issues. Um, so if anybody is interested in guest editing uh, a special issue, um, then please do get in touch with me um, if you're interested in contributing to the journal, either as a peer reviewer or as an author or as part of our editorial board, then again, please, please email me. Um, we would be delighted to hear from you. Um, I would like to take this opportunity as well to say a massive thank you to everybody who has been supporting us as a journal. We couldn't possibly have done this without the authors, um, the peer reviewers, the uh, brilliant editorial board team that has been um, growing over the last um, decade, really, and um, includes people from across the globe, um, both academics as well as practitioners um, who enable us to, for instance, support students in developing their paper to a standard that uh, means that it can be published as an original original research article in its own right. Um, and of course, also the, the readers uh, who continue to, to make this worthwhile, um, everybody's effort. Uh, we're really delighted that uh, UCL Press have, um, over the last five or six years, uh, been the publisher uh, behind the journal and are really committed to open access publication um, as well and have just uh, done tremendous things in terms of the prof professionalization of the journal. Um, and of course, the other thing to say is that um, there are other opportunities to engage in the dialogue as well to celebrate the diversity and learn with each other. Um, I alluded very briefly earlier to the Global Alliance for Social Pedagogy and Social Education, uh, which is a kind of emerging um, community um, across the globe um, that includes um, different national organizations and associations uh, for social pedagogues and uh, social educators. Um, and we want to continue to grow this um, as a, an open, inclusive community 
Um, and I'm more than happy to, to send you further details about this. Um, and also to invite you to a free virtual session that we're holding uh, titled Social Pedagogy in Practice. Uh, that will happen at the end of this month um, on the 29th um, of June. Um, and you can also um, hear more about the Global Alliance at the Co-Building a New Eco-Social World Conference um, that focuses again on a topic that is very much highly relevant to us in uh, 2022 and will continue to be so in the future. Um, and finally, you can also just email us at global-alliance at social-pedagogy.org.uk uh, for any further details. And I'm sure that Anna will do a tremendous job in putting all of that together as part of your conference uh, dissemination as well. In that case, um, from my side, I would just like to, to thank you all. And thanks to all contributors, uh, both virtually and um, everybody um, in Warsaw for making this happen and uh, joining in with the session. Um, and from my side, it would be just enough to say, Jinguye is much nego. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you very much, all the honorable guests in this session. We will now move into lunch break. We, I'm sorry we can't invite you, but um, I'm sure next time maybe you can come and visit Warsaw, maybe next year for a conference in September. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye, you so everyone. much. Great time. Thank you. Lovely meeting you. And you. So practical yeah. announcements. You. Um, as you know, from two o'clock we are moving online because this would be probably difficult for us to keep the attention in the hybrid session like this. So. You know, if you, if you need uh, some sort of access to laptop here, of course, it can be organized. If you have your own equipment that you want to log in through, you obviously use that. Uh, so the online session starts at 2 o'clock with the keynote from Professor Claire Cameron from uh, UCL in, uh, in London, uh, followed by um, individual sessions and closed by Professor Kathleen Mannion at 1600 hours. Uh, now we have a lunch break, so all registered participants can go to Bar Filmowe, the film bar, uh, to have some lunch, and it's the same as yesterday. You can have soup and second course, or second course and a drink. It's your choice. So uh, enjoy your lunch break. Thank you. Thank you.